continuing on refraction. Let's look at some actual numbers of indices of refraction for interesting materials. Let's see, of course, n equals 1 corresponds to light traveling at exactly the speed of light, in other words, a perfect vacuum. But in general, n might be a little bit higher if it's going through some other transparent medium that has some dielectric constant that's not 1. Actual air in room temperature is just a little bit higher index of refraction than 1. You could usually treat it as just about 1, 1 and 0.01 or 0.02. But now we have some other transparent materials here. The one I'd like you to particularly look at is water, 4 thirds, 1.33. So that means that light waves travel at only 3 fourths their normal speed when traveling through water. And if you want to slow it down even more, here's an index of refraction of a typical glass that would be used in optics, 1.5 is the index of refraction. That means that the light is slowed down by 50%. It's only going two-thirds of the speed it would in a vacuum. If you want to get higher index of refraction than one and a half, it's getting more expensive. There are some fancier glasses where you can get in above one and a half, but uh, it's going to cost you. You want something that has a really high index of refraction that produces spectacular refractive uh, kind of light show, then you got to go up to something like diamond, which is very expensive. Or if you're cheap and you want to get some zirconium, that's a pretty high index of refraction. It doesn't look as nice as diamonds, though. I will tell you what the index of refraction of the medium is on problems that we put on the exams. There's the numbers. This tells you by how much the speed of light slows down when it passes through these mediums. Let's get back now to refraction. We wanted to see how this actually changes the direction of the light when it goes from a medium having one index of refraction to a medium having a different index of refraction. You're going to need to know both cases, where the light passes from a low end to a high end medium, and then from a high end to a low end medium. They're very symmetric. What's a good analogy here? I'm going to start out with a very good analogy to anybody who goes to UCLA football games. And I don't know if you've actually seen this, but the UCLA marching band is extremely organized. And in fact, the musicians line up in very straight rows with very uniform spacing. That's what I'm showing in my slider. This marching band, I don't know where I got this. It looks a little bit military, doesn't it? Well, anyway, this is the maybe the U.S. Army marching band, and here are the soldiers, sorry, the musicians are marching along in uniformly spaced rows, which we could call wave fronts. If you want to think of this as wave fronts of light, that's a good way to describe electromagnetic waves. And they're traveling here in a green medium, let's say that's uh, on the field, and that is a, corresponds to a low index of refraction medium. In fact, it could even be an index of refraction of 1. In other words, they're going fairly fast here. What happens if, maybe this is not according to the script, accidentally the marching band starts heading at an oblique angle here towards a boundary where they're getting off the field and they're stepping into mud. It was overwatered for some reason. Ugh. Uh, as soon as the marchers transition from the nice grass that's easy to walk on to the sticky mud, they immediately slow down. Oh, that's just exactly analogous to light wave fronts going from a fast medium encountering a high index of refraction medium shown by brown mud, and they start slowing down. But notice because they're coming in at an angle here, what you see is that the part of the wavefront, the marchers, who are on the right-hand side here, they hit the slow medium. They get slowed down in the mud first. So they're already slowed down here. This one has slowed down the most because he's been in the mud for a little bit. But notice that these marchers over here on the left side of the wavefront are still zooming along at the high speed that they had before. They haven't gotten to the muddy part yet. So they're catching up a little bit to these guys stuck in the mud here. And by the time they hit the mud, they've gained a little bit of a lead. Or at least they're not as far behind. When the wavefront came out, he was out here in the green, uh, this marcher was way ahead of this one over here. But by the time they exit into the mud, this marcher has 
done a good bit. This is a pretty dramatic example of a big change in the index of a fraction. In other words, a big slowing down here. This marcher has, is still behind this one. He's still not as far down, but he's caught up quite a bit of the distance. So now, after passing through this transition, the marchers are again in evenly spaced rows. But notice the spacing of the rows is now smaller. That corresponds to the wavelength of light. If you were thinking about electromagnetic waves, now the peaks, say the maxima in the electric field, which used to be this far apart, are now a shorter distance apart. The wavelength has decreased exactly in proportion to how the speed of the wave, the speed of light, has decreased by this fraction, the ratio of the two indices of fraction in the green and the brown. But here's the most important thing. Notice that because of this tilting effect, because the slowing down happened first to the wavefront on the right and then gradually propagated over and happened last to the left side of the wavefront, it has turned, it has changed direction at the boundary here. And now you'll notice, and this always is the case, that the wavefront is now marching, the, the sorry, the marching band here is now marching closer to the perpendicular to the way the index boundary here. This is the boundary layer which in my drawing here is exactly horizontal and the wavefront came in at a fairly large angle but it exited at a smaller angle. In other words if you wanted to measure the angle coming in you draw a normal a perpendicular line to this boundary, which is straight up and down, up and down in the y-axis. The angle of incidence was the angle from there over to here. Fairly big angle. It looks like it's about maybe 40 degrees in this example. But when you exit into higher index of refraction medium, the angle of exidence, or the outgoing angle, has gone down. It's gotten smaller started out 40 degrees away from the normal. Now here, it looks like it's down to maybe 20 degrees away from the normal. I'm just trying to do a protractor by eye here. But this gives you a qualitative example of what's going to happen. Now consider light wave fronts instead of UCLA marching band. The process is exactly the same. The squishing together of the wavelengths and the bending at the medium closer towards the normal when you go to the slower uh, medium, the higher index of refraction medium. Now this can be quantified and Snell's law is the formula that quantifies this. And I'm not going to do the derivation but I'll tell you the result of this derivation because it's really very interesting. The derivation is, well okay, how much? I got it. How much does the wavefront bend? Yes, it's going to slow down when it hits the mud but by how much? By what angle? The answer is, well, here's a bunch of possible examples of paths that light rays might take. Suppose that the light ray starts out up here at source, and it comes down and encounters a higher index of refraction medium. Maybe it goes from air into something with a higher end, larger than one, like, I don't know, water, for example. And we expect that it's going to bend when it hits this medium, and it'll eventually end up down here. And it could have taken, I suppose, in principle, in theory, any of these different paths would get you from the source to the detector. But in fact, light, according to Snell's law, always chooses to take exactly the path here. I'm, I'm showing a few possibilities, path one, path two, path three, path four. It always takes the path which gets it from the source to the detector in the least amount of time the fastest trip from the source detector. That's the one that light actually chooses. That's a very deep physical reason. But I'm just going to lighten this up a little bit. It's exactly mathematically analogous to a situation which, although I never watched this uh, 90s uh, television series called Baywatch, happens apparently every single episode. Let me set it up for you. Every single episode, without fail, a lifeguard is sitting on the beach, on the lifeguard chair here, being admired by everybody. This could be uh, Pamela Lee. It could be David Hasselhoff. And every episode without fail, there's a very attractive swimmer out here who really shouldn't be out there, doesn't know how to swim, who is looks like or at least gives the appearance of possibly drowning out here. Immediately, uh, David or Pamela or one of the uh, <clears throat> substitute stars grabs their rescue board and has to get from their lifeguard station to the 
pathetic swimmer in the shortest possible time so they won't drown. Uh, nobody's going to die on this show, obviously. What's the shortest p amount of time? Well, you. this is a difficult calculation, particularly for someone like Pamela Lee. To do this all in her head instantly is pretty impressive feat. So that's, although I have, as I said, never seen this show, uh, it does illustrate a little bit of physics, actually. What is the least time? Let's just think about it very naively. Okay, what if you were a beginning lifeguard? You say, well, the person is out here. The shortest distance between me and the drowning victim here is a straight line illustrated by path two. Yeah, safeguard, that is the, sorry, lifeguard, that's the straightest path. It's the shortest number of meters to get from where you're sitting, but I don't think that's the shortest amount of time. You go that way and that person might drown. Why is that? Because you're going to be slowed down very dramatically. You can run really fast on the sand, and they do, even when they do slow-mo to show their beautiful running technique. Uh, they still go very fast on the sand. The second that these guys hit the water, they're slowed down very severely, just the way light waves would slow down as they go from air to water. And so the first, it's very dramatic. Oh, it looks like I'm going to save you. Don't worry. Don't lose hope. I'm oh, sorry. Shh. Splash, splash, splash. Actually, maybe you are going to drown now. You have this long path here that the light has to travel through the slow index. Maybe this is water. And that could kill you. So, could you do better than that? Well, if, you're, if you really are a terrible swimmer, I have to say these people on Baywatch were actually pretty good swimmers, I believe, but they just can't go as fast as they can run at a dead run on the sand. So if you were a terrible swimmer, you might say, I am going to go, all, I'm going to minimize the swimming. I'm going to just go all the way on the beach out to here until I'm directly opposite the drowning victim. So I'll run all the way along with the sand, but I can run really fast and it looks really good on camera. And then I'm going to swim the shortest possible distance. I might take a path like four. You could do that but I'm sorry to say that person's probably going to drown here also. That would be a mistake because you went so, you added so much distance to your trip on the sand. I know you're going fast. I know you're a great sprinter, but you added so much more distance here that the time to get uh, to the, your destination has actually been lengthened. It might be, anyway, that was, a, that was a bad play. The best way to go, and this is something that's very difficult to judge in your head intuitively, but with Snell's Law, you could work it out mathematically. If you actually have to sit down and work out the formula for Snell's Law with a pencil and paper, that person is already going to drown. Too bad. So you just have to intuit this. You want to run at, you want to run more on the beach where you can go fast, but then still leave yourself some of the distance to go on the water. So you want to lengthen your trip, your total number of meters of your trip, enough, but not too much. You want to go on a path that looks something like three here. How steep is this angle? Well, the angle is going to be steeper and steeper here. The bigger the difference in speed is between running on the beach and swimming in the water. The bigger the dist or if you want to talk about light waves, the bigger the difference is between the low index of refraction here, where the light waves are going fast, and then the high index of refraction here, where the light waves slow down. If that's a big difference, there's going to be a very strong angle, a very sharp bend. If it's a small difference, there'll be not much bend at all. And obviously, if the index of refraction was the same on both sides, you'd just take the shortest distance. You'd take path two. Then there'd be no refraction. Duh. That would be boring. That's not our lecture here. So here's the example shown with light. It's the same thing as on Baywatch. The light comes in here at an angle of incidence, theta 1. And then in our case here, which is analogous to Baywatch, it jumps from a low index of refraction medium. Heck, with air, this n is just a little bit more than 1. Goes into water where the index of refraction, what was that? That was about 1 and a third, 1.33. And as we expect here, there is a bend closer towards the normal. So we just expect here, without knowing anything else about it, this angle coming out, the refraction angle or the angle of outsidence, if you want to call it that, theta 2 has got to be smaller than theta 1. We're getting closer to the normal. By how much? It depends on the ratio of n1 to n2. Let's look at the formula now where Mr. Snell sets it all up for us. There's your formula. The 
index of refraction on the first medium that you're traveling in times the sine of the angle that you come in on. This is always, remember, the angle between your incident ray and the normal, the normal to the surface, to the boundary, which in the, is perpendicular, to the boundary is in the x direction, the perpendicular in my drawing is in the y direction. This angle, take the sine of theta 1, multiply that times n1, it's equal to n2, that's the higher index of refraction medium here that you move into, times the sine of the outsidence angle, sine of theta 2, that's the angle that the refracted ray makes from the normal in there. By the way, this formula works for all angles. It doesn't matter if these angles are small. Well, in a lot of optics, you'll notice I'm going to make the small angle approximation that sine theta is approximately equal to theta. That would work for angles up to maybe 20, 30 degrees or so, uh, decreasing accuracy. But this formula is true for all values of theta. Theta could even be 90 degrees here. 80 degrees, this uh, formula still works. And it's also, of course, true regardless of whether the first medium, in my case, has a low N, or the first medium could have a high N, and you could move into a low N. So N2 could be larger, or N1 could be larger. That'd be another case. That would be the opposite of Baywatch. That would be Pamela Lee trying to get out of the water as fast as she could, for some reason, because there's a casting agent on the beach. She wants to run over there by the fastest path. Either way, the path that she would take is the same as the path that she took running into the water in the shortest time uh, to get out uh, to rescue that uh, person who she's now forgotten about. And so that I'm showing that in the second slide here. The this is exactly the same curve here as long as I don't change the media uh, the index of refraction of water still being 1.33 and the index in air being 1. This path here and these angles here are the same as these angles here and here, except in this case I labeled it 1 because we started from below, and I labeled this 2 because we ended up here. But these are the same situation. It's perfectly symmetric whether the light is going up or whether the light is coming down here in my diagram. By the way, this all diagram also shows something else interesting that we're going to be concerned with. Some of the light here, when it encounters a change in the index of refraction medium, will bounce off and be reflected. That's another, and then some of, only some will be refracted. So every time you encounter a change in the index of refraction, you're going to lose some of the light that started out. Some of it reflects, maybe you didn't want that, maybe you wanted that, some of it refracts and that turns out to be important later on. The refracted ray, by the way, just to jump the gun a little bit here, always comes back out at exactly the same angle from the normal that it came in. So this angle here for the reflected ray, the angle of reflection, is always exactly equal to the angle coming in theta 1. So this over here is also theta 1 here. As you can see, this is drawn correctly. And this also happens, reflection also happens, for example, if light was going through water, it happens any change in n. doesn't matter whether n is getting higher or lower. Just the fact that the index of refraction changes causes some reflection. And again, the angle in, theta 1 here, which in this case is a smaller angle, is exactly matched by exactly equal to the reflected angle going back into the water back down here. We'll get to that later when we talk about mirrors. And I think that this diagram really just shows the same thing here, that here's an example where the blue medium has a lower index of refraction. It could be air or water or something. And then the higher index of refraction medium is shown in beige. That could be glass, for example, has a higher index. And sure enough, the ray, if it's incident here, gets closer to the normal or if the ray comes through the glass and then escapes into a lower index refraction medium, it refracts away from the normal here. And um, the only case where you don't have any interesting refraction we mentioned before is if you're coming in at an angle of incidence which is exactly zero. If the theta A is zero, then you go in perfectly normal. There's no difference between the light ray and the normal, and it goes through and refracts perfectly uh, along the normal, and the reflected ray comes perfectly back out. But that's a special boring case. All the formulas I'm giving you, of course, will work for this case too, but they're just boring in that case. All right, I don't think there's any other new information in that slide. Let's go to the next one. What happens now in the case of two refractions, 
caused by glass. I'm going to give you the simplest case I can think of first here. We'll go from a low index of refraction medium. In fact, I'm just going to stick with air here. So that should be index of refraction n is around 1. Then we'll go through a thin, could be thick actually, a slab of flat glass. So it has two flat parallel surfaces, which in my drawing here, I've drawn them exactly uh, vertical along the y-axis. So here's the beginning of the glass on the left side, and then here's the end of the glass on the right side. And then it goes back uh, on the far right side. It leaves the glass, it, having traveled across it, it exits the glass going into air again. So we're going from uh, n equals 1 to maybe n equals 1 and a half back to n equals 1. So low n, high n, low n. We're going to have two refractions here, and I'm asking you now to figure out what the combined effect of those two refractions is going to be. So this dotted line is not actually the path that the light ray would take. It's going to be refracted once when it has to pass from n equals 1 to a higher n, and then again, it's also going to suffer a refraction, according to Snell's law, as it passes from the high end back to the low end. But that refraction is going to be the opposite way. The first refraction bends this light ray closer towards the normal. So instead of going on a straight line, this light ray is going to bend down a little bit. It's not going to go up that much. It'll bend closer to the normal as it passes through the glass. So then you might think, so where is it eventually going to exit? Well, it's going to exit not at 1, because 1 is where it would exit if it didn't bend at all. But we know that can't be right. That would only be right if this was air all the way through. But we've stuck some glass, a slab of n equals 1.5 material through here. So it's going to refract down towards a normal. It should exit around 2. That's the correct answer here. Three would be it just goes tr totally along the normal. That's not going to happen. Glass doesn't have a huge index of refraction. So three is wrong. Two is the best answer. It's going to exit somewhere around two. But now here's a more interesting question. OK, so it bends through the glass here due to refraction. Now it's going to refract again as it's exiting right at that spot there. See that spot about two? It's going to exit again with a refraction going from the high end to the low end medium. So which way does it refract as it exits? In other words, what is the final direction that the, the light was traveling? It was originally traveling upwards like that. Then it, its slope got shallower going through the glass. But now it's going to do the exact opposite of what it did going from the air to the glass. Now it's going from glass to air. And so now everything in Snell's Law formula, remember Snell's Law formula said n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. Well, now theta 1 and theta 2 are reversed when we're down here. And it's going to bend away from, so it's not going to just exit at this angle. It's going to bend back away from the normal, and it's going to be going in the same direction that it originally was, just displaced upward. So here's a better drawing of it in this diagram here. It's a schematic. Here in the air is a large angle of incidence between the light rays path and the normal. In the glass, it's closer to the normal. It's more horizontal here. And then, as it escapes the glass, it bends back away from the normal to the this, this angle here exiting is the same angle it came in with, whatever the angle it was. The only difference is that now the path has been displaced downward a bit. So, if you want to see an actual picture of this with a laser going through a block of glass, it comes in at this angle, it bends refracted through the glass, and then it refracts back into the air this way. This, if you look carefully, you can see that the slope of this line is exactly the same as the slope of this line. So the light ray, when it, when it came in, this is a little bit fainter light ray, I guess a little bit got absorbed, light ray going out, exactly parallel, but they're displaced a little bit. So if you had a flat slab of glass, it might, under some circumstances, be useful to just move a beam sideways, if you wanted to do that for some reason in your optical design. But that's a very simple case. We obviously want to handle more interesting cases than that. So let's look at the next easiest case. Now having dealt with a flat glass slab, let's do a glass 
with two surfaces that has an angle. In other words, what people usually call a prism. Here's a prism. I've got a, looks like a sort of a 45 degree prism here. And so the light ray in this first uh, fairly simple concept question is the light ray is coming in from the left and I want to know where it's going to exit on the right hand surface here. Well that ought to be actually pretty simple because the light ray is in fact coming in exactly along the normal. It's exactly 90 degrees away from this vertical boundary surface. So it comes in at 90 and it goes through at 90 and it's going to go straight through just like it was going straight horizontal and it's going to exit right over here at 2. So that answer was very simple because the angle of uh, incidence here was 0. Sine of 0 is 0. So it doesn't matter what n1 and n2 are, does it? Who cares? I mean n times you know, we have n times sine theta is equal to zero. So sine theta just has to be zero. That's the only way you can make it. I don't care what the n's are. So the angle in and the angle out has to be sine theta of zero, and that's satisfied only if you travel at zero degrees away from the normal and you exit over here. The more interesting question is question two, though. Which direction is the ray going to go as it exits? As it exits, it, you can see in this diagram, it's actually coming about, a, here's, here's the normal to that surface. You have to take a local normal vector, it would look like this. So the ray that's trying to cross this boundary here, it's going to cross it, it's coming in at about a 45 degree angle away from the normal. So we have N of the glass here times the sine of 45, which is about uh, 0.7 is going to equal the index of a fraction out here, which is 1, times sine of the outgoing angle. The outgoing angle will be how, here's the normal going out. How many degrees away from that are we? So we're going to have a formula that says what? Um, 1.5 times 0.7. Well, I'm not going to do the numbers right now. Uh, it's going to be a larger angle than 45 degrees. So it's going to exit at this point, but now it's going to be more than 45 degrees away from this surface here. In other words, it's going to be below the horizontal. It's going to exit down like that. How far down depends on how much the index of refraction of the medium has changed. Anyway, it's heading down like that. Right, so it came in horizontally, it went horizontally all the way through the glass prism, but as it exits the tilted surface, it refracts down. Okay, got that. Now, let's look at the more interesting question. What happens if the light ray came from the right hand side instead? So it encountered the tilted surface first. That's a slightly more interesting question. It comes in from the right to traveling to the left, it hits the tilted surface here. Because it's moving to a medium that has a higher index of refraction, it's going to get closer to the normal. The normal locally here being this line that crosses the boundary, exactly perpendicular. So it's going to get closer to that. So in, it will then bend down a little bit. So here's 40, maybe that's about 45 degrees here. This is less. This might be about 30 degrees away from the normal. So it bends down in the glass here. And then what happens as it exits the glass? Now it's coming down here. It's going to exit it at around position 3. It doesn't go straight through. It bends down to position 3. But then here's the fun thing about a prism. Both sides of a prism are designed to refract the light in the same direction. You get double the refraction power. You get some refraction power from the first surface, it bends it down towards the normal. Then as it exits, it's coming in an angle, and it gets further bent. This way, it's, this angle was the angle from the normal. It, and if it exited with no bending, it would just come straight out like that. But you get a further bend down because going to air, let's say this is air out here, it bends away, away from the normal. So it has to bend down even further. So you get one bend here, and then you get another bend down here. That's the basic idea of, of making a prism. 
All right, so that's been all very qualitative now. We're going to get quantitative here. So here's an actual quantitative problem. I could actually put this problem on the first midterm exam. This has got all of the material you need to know. It's got a little bit of geometry in here. For those of you who like geometry, that's good. For those of you like me who are not huge fans of geometry, you'll survive this. You'll survive it. Well, we just have to read the problem carefully and keep track of the angles. And in particular, we have to keep track of uh, complementary and supplementary angles. We've got to make sure when we know when something adds up to 90 degrees or 180 degrees, uh, and then we'll be okay in this. So they don't seem to tell you very much about this. They tell you that you have a glass prism here, and this green glass material, which is transparent to light, has an index of refraction of one and a half. And we'll just say that the index of refraction in the air here, it's, it's a vacuum, it's about one. I'll just one will be good enough approximation for these problems. And here is the normal angle to the, this first surface that the light comes in. By the way, this problem would work exactly the same here if the light came in from the right and bent through. It would travel on the same path. So it actually doesn't matter whether the arrow is going this way from left to right or if the arrow is going from right to left. The path, the red line that the line light actually takes, would be the same. Anyway, in this problem, we're told that this angle it comes in at a 45-degree line with respect to the normal here. And we're expected to figure out everything else to figure out what angle it exits down here, right? Remember, it bends down once, bends down twice. We already figured that out from before. How much? Let's use Snell's Law quantitatively. First time we're really going to get quantitative with Snell's Law. One other thing you need to know, it's an equilateral triangle. I circle that here with my cursor because that's in italics. I might not necessarily tell you on the exam that that's a very important part of the problem. But some of these words are chosen carefully. That tells you what this angle up here is. Right? The top angle of this triangle, since it's equilateral, you can see that all these sides, all three sides are equal. This needs to be 60 degrees. They're all 60 degrees because, let's remember this, total sum of the three angles of triangle always adds to the total of 180 degrees. That's right. We're going to use that. So let's see then. The angle of incidence here in air is 45 degrees. What does Snell's Law say? The first side of Snell's Law says N1 sine theta 1. Well, N1 is N, the index of refraction in air is 1, so I've got a 1 here. 1 times sine theta 1, sine theta 1 is 45 degrees. So 1 times that is just sine of theta, which is 0 0.707. It's the square root of 2 over 2, in case you're wondering in this example. But you might do this, maybe not in your head, you might do it on a calculator. Please don't forget, especially if it's a brand new calculator you bought, to make sure that you have specified the argument, the angle of sine theta 1, in degrees. Because in this problem, it's given to degrees. If you just turn on a random calculator that you bought in the store, it might be thinking that your input was given in radians. But this problem didn't give it to you in radians. This is something less, a little bit less than one radian. You'll get the wrong answer and you won't even know why you got it wrong, just because you were kind of not thinking about uh, the peculiarities of your calculator. This wouldn't even mean you didn't know the physics. It just means you didn't know your calculator and you got confused between degrees and radians. Can't believe how many people would make that mistake, except that I warned you, please don't make that mistake. I hate to take off one point for that, for calculator error. I'm only going to take off one point. Anyway, this is the left-hand side of the Snell's Law equation. And according to Snell's Law, this equals n2 sine theta 2. Well, actually, sine theta 2 is not really shown here. Theta 2 is the angle inside the glass away from this black dashed line. The black dashed line here is the normal. And so I need to know how many degrees away it is from the normal here. That's the first thing I've got. That's what Snell's Law is going to tell me. It didn't immediately tell me all the other angles I need. Snell's Law will tell me the angle between this black dashed line and this outgoing red line that's passing deeper into the glass. And according to that, N2 times sine theta is equal to 0 0.707. N2 is 1.5. So if I divide points, so let's divide both sides by N2. So I divide 
0.707 by 1.5, and that is the sine of the angle I want. You need a calculator then that can do the reverse process. If you know the sine of the angle that you're trying to figure out, you're going to have to have a calculator that does the inverse sine, the arc sine. In other words, what angle gives me a sine of this? By the way, what is that? 0.707 divided by 1.5. I don't know. It's like the arc sine of 0.4 something. Anyway, if your calculator is programmed to give you the answer in degrees, we're doing this in degrees, please, then the correct answer exactly here will be 28.1 degrees. So this little angle in here that the normal makes with the red uh, light path is 28.1 degrees. So what's this angle here? The angle from the surface of the prism to the red line. Well, this angle plus 28.1 degrees makes a right angle. How do I know it makes a right angle? Because by definition, the black dashed line is the normal to the surface. The normal to the surface is always at right angles to the surface. So this angle here is 28.1. This angle must be 90 minus 28.1 which I guess is, well, I don't know what it is. It's about 61.9. Anyway, um, that's still, that's the first step of the problem. Now we figured out what this angle is. Now we need to use one little piece of geometry, but it's really a very little piece. I know this angle here. I know this angle is 60. So the sum of all three of these angles has to add up to... 180, that's right, because it's a weird looking triangle, but the sum of the angles always has to sum up to 180. So I've got 60 plus 90 is 150 minus 28.1. If you add 58.1, then this angle will make the correct total 180 degrees of the triangle. So this angle here is 58.1 degrees. Is that the, as we approach the second refraction here, many people might make this mistake. Are we just going to use Snell's law again? Yes, we are. Going from the high index medium to the low index medium? Yes, we are. But now, what's theta 1? N1, of course, is now 1 and a half. N2 is just 1. But what is theta 1? It's the angle away from the normal. Is that 58.1? No! Don't do that. It's not 58.1. Same deal as here. It's the complement of the angle of incidence. The angle of incidence is the angle that that red light ray makes with respect to the normal. It's this angle over here. It's 90 minus 58.1. 90 minus 58.1 is 31.9. So we have our Snell's law formula is n times the sine of 31.9 degrees. That's 1.5 times, or the sine of 31.9 degrees, it's just a little more than a half. So then you multiply that according to Snell's law by n1 here. Now n1 is one and a half. So you take one and a half times 0.53. That is the sine of the angle that we're looking for, the angle called question mark. Well, if the angle called question mark has this as its sign, which looks like it's going to be about uh, 0.8 or so, 0.78 or something, then you have to take the arc sign of this on your calculator and you find the correct answer, 52.4 degrees, making sure that you took your arc sign to give you degrees as the answer. So that's a fairly non-trivial problem I could give you on the exam, give you five or six, seven minutes to work through that, and I've shown you the most likely mistakes that people would make where I'd count off a point. But as long as you keep track of what the angles are in Snell's Law. Well, I memorized Snell's Law. I memorized, memorized it. I got it. I, I'm glad that you memorized it. You can write it down in your card. But if you're not clear about where theta 1 is and what theta 2 is and where n1 is and where n2 is, you, you could get into some trouble. So watch out. Now, Snell's Law, of course, applies to all waves, because refraction applies to all waves, including not just electromagnetic waves we're interested in this course. So here's one other example 
two other examples where Snell's law also applies to water waves traveling, for example, uh, on the beach, getting back to Baywatch. Don't know if this was actually ever explained in Baywatch. You know, I was thinking of doing like a whole lecture on the physics of Baywatch. It's going to be a really short lecture. There's just not much <clears throat> there. But uh, it also applies to sound waves and it also, oh, well, look, I have another example applying to light waves here, which is a little more right up our alley with optics here. But I like this aerial view of the beach here. Maybe Pamela Lee is down there trying to rescue somebody. And this explains a phenomenon that you may, surfers are very familiar with this, but uh, other normal people might not really be aware of this. All beaches, before you get to the beach, the waves uh, come in at uh, some angle. that They may have been set up in some tropical storm a thousand miles away in these crests. There's one peak of the water, there's another peak of the water, and another peak of the water. And they usually come in at random angles when they hit uh, Long Beach or Venice Beach or Malibu or whatever. But refraction happens in basically the last few hundred feet after this wave's been traveling for a thousand miles. Why? Because the water wave, as it hits shallow water, slows down. Shallow water is just very much to a water wave is very much like a high index of refraction medium is to electromagnetic waves. It slows the wave down and so refraction happens there also. So this, this is the zone here, where just the last few hundred feet here, where the speed of the wave really slows down. So look what happens here. You have a, remember it's just like the UCLA marching band. You have waves coming in like this, they start hitting the shallow water here near the shore, and it's like going through the mud. These waves suddenly slow down, not suddenly, but pretty dramatically slow down here. These waves cruise on, zoom. They're, they're zooming on like these. These waves, waves look like they're kind of left behind. What's the result? You can see what's happening here. The result is the wave was from uh, deep water. The wave was coming in at, at quite an angle. I'm just trying to show you here, quite an angle to the beach. Get, hits the shallow water and ends up being bent closer to the normal. The normal is this way. So whatever direction the wave was coming in, by the time it washes up onto your sand here, where the surfers are going to catch it, it is closer to the normal. The waves, wherever direction they came from, tend to hit the beach fairly close to face on parallel to the beach. You can see these waves bending toward, they're bending towards the beach, all over the beach here, because of that refraction property. And another way of looking at it, by the way, this is just Snell's law written here, with velocity of the wave here. And so if the velocity slows down here, as you refract into a slower medium here, then since this is smaller, then this sine theta 2 is going to have to be smaller too. You can see it here. In other words, the angle away from the normal gets smaller. The wave gets closer to the normal when it slows down, or the wave gets closer to the normal when it passes into the high index of refraction medium. And here's a little more subtle example, but you might as well have a look at it here. There's also refraction happening, well, whenever, even with air, so far, I was a little cavalier, and I said, well, air pretty much is like a vacuum. Yeah, it has an edge of refraction of about one. Pretty close, but it's a little bit more than one. Light doesn't travel exactly as fast in air as it does in a vacuum. The vacuum is the fastest it can go. That's the fastest speed. That's your, your classic speed of light. Uh, you know, 299,800 something or other meters per second. That's the fast as it can go. In air, it's a few percent slower than that, unless the air gets thinner for some reason, closer to a vacuum. How could the air get thinner? If you're in a desert, for example, and the air has just been sitting very still right above a searingly hot desert floor that's been baked by the afternoon sun. Then what you get is a situation, well, all right, I'll show you this. What you, all right, so suppose it's in the morning, you're not in a desert, you're just looking at light from a tree. All right, just this is one example here. The light rays come straight to you. 
there's no illusions. So you just follow the light rays back and you look at it and you say, I see light from a tree, it's over there, it's traveling in a straight line, that's no problem. Duh, how trivial. The light rays that go down in the ground, you're not going to see them. But what if there's a thinner layer of very hot air? Suppose now you're in a desert here. Okay, I know, there's no trees in the desert. Okay, this is a cactus. It's not a tree, it's, it should be a cactus. Anyway, so now there's a lower index of refraction layer on, just might be a few feet high, just simmering here on the bottom of the desert. Now, if the light waves, um, you know, so the light waves from the tree, it can send some light waves through the cool air up here and they go more or less straight. So you might still see a picture of the cactus looking, you know, see, see a view of it directly where it is. But if you look carefully, now light rays that went down towards the ground, which if it was a normal day and it didn't have this hot air on the ground, you wouldn't have seen it at all. But because this air has such a low index of refraction, the light ray, it's the opposite of, of hitting the mud. It's hitting like the speed ramp. These light rays speed up. Woo, we're free. We can go through very thin air. So these light rays actually catch up with the, this wave front isn't moving that fast. These are going faster. They catch up and it actually refracts the light wave front up to your eye. This is grossly exaggerated. These angles are a lot smaller than this, unless it's a heck of a desert. But in fact then, light rays that would not normally have hit you get refracted from the cactus, let's say, and come back up, they appear to be coming up to your eye. And your eye, it's the thing about eyes, it's just connected to your brain, it never realizes what's actually happening, right? Your brain is not wired to figure out the physics problem's head. Your brain looks at this light ray coming seemingly down and it extrapolates back and says, you know what? there's a cactus in the ground. There's an underground cactus, because I can see light coming from the top of it, and it's, it's underneath the ground here. Oh, and by the way, it looks upside down. Also, that's called a mirage. And here's an example of one. Here's a fairly <clears throat> unsettling picture. You seem to be pursued in the desert now by two police on motorcycles that I don't know, maybe they noticed that you were like trying to read your physics book when you should just be watching the road at this point and not texting about physics. And so we see the direct images of them. This is, these images, the light from the headlight is coming through relatively normal, cool air, fairly slow. But then light goes down from the headlights, reflects off of the basically this very hot layer of thin air, and we see mirage of both of them. My God, it looks like we're being pursued by four motorcycle cops, and two of them are upside down, and they're driving underneath the road. That's really scary. I'm just going to pull over right now and get my license and registration out. This is too freaky. Anyway, that, of course, is just a double mirage here. These are inverted images, and um, some, it kind of looks, if you look at this enough, it's sort of, uh, say you're looking at a palm tree or something, it kind of looks like there's a puddle of water here, because a puddle of water would, would do exactly the same thing. It would reflect an image of like an upside-down cactus. And so that's the classic thing, you know, in the desert movie or something, you're, you're, you're dying for a drink or whatever, and you see a cactus, and it looks like it's sitting, it literally looks like it's sitting in a pool of water, but it's not. You crawl over there, and the mirage is gone. And if you don't find some water soon, you're going to die of uh, dehydration. So that's another example of refraction. And I like that example because it shows something that really we're going to go on and on here for a whole week about, which is that what your eyes see is the final direction of the light rays as they're coming to your eye. And you just are built, you're hardwired, your brain assumes that those light rays were always traveling in a straight line to get to you, and that's not necessarily true, is it? Might not be the case. In other words, refractions will make you think something is not what it actually is. It's, it's an illusion. 
Here's a, a classic example that you must know. I want you to know this. We're looking at the light emerging from an actual object that is really at point P here in some water. Okay, this diagram is a little bit lame because really we should be looking down at some water. For, but anyway, for whatever reason, this we're looking sideways at a tank of water. So the water seems to be held up or, uh, vertically here. So here is air, index of refraction NB is about 1. And then water, index of refraction in the blue water is about 1.33. Yes, so that's larger than 1. And so whenever you have the light rays originating from a point P, when they hit the boundary escaping to the air, to the lower index of refraction medium, and they get to travel faster, they bend which way? Away from the normal. They're coming at an angle. By the time they exit, they're exiting further from the normal. Opposite, I mean, it's the same deal down here. This ray was going down. It exits even further down. They spread out when they hit this boundary. The light ray that goes straight across, okay, it just goes straight across. All of these rays obey Snell's law with the same change in the index of refraction. The ratio of the, of the sine theta 1 to sine theta 2 is, is 1.33 to 1. Notice, though, what your brain, when it processes these diverging light rays, what does it think? It looks, it traces back, say you catch a few of these light rays here. Your brain traces them back to where they intersect, where it thinks, mistakenly, it thinks they were traveling on straight lines all the way back. It mistakenly thinks that these straight lines emanated originally from the point of intersection up here at point P prime. Not the actual source of the light rays, but that's what your brain thinks. Your brain thinks that the light rays emanated from a point which is closer than it actually is. And also, suppose this is not just a point. Suppose, for example, I don't know, suppose this is a fish in the water. It looks closer and it looks bigger. It looks closer and bigger than it actually is. This boundary, this flat boundary of water here, actually acts as a bit of a magnifier. Let's look at the actual numbers for this effect. And this effect is known to everybody who's ever looked at anything in the water. Here's the actual diagram. We're going to do a worked example here. Here we are. Well, this is an innocuous puzzle. We got someone dropped their pair of goggles in the pool, and it's one meter down in the water. That's where it actually is. The goggles are really down there, and it sends light rays in various directions. And so let's say we're, we're floating up here on the surface, in the air, so your eyeball is in the air, and it's looking down at light that originated from the goggles. So, um, the goggles light, for let's take one bit of light here. It sends some light up at an angle like this. When it reaches the boundary to the air, instead of going straight, it bends away from the normal. So theta 1 here is going to be a bit bigger than theta 2, right? That it bends away. So this is the same diagram I just showed you just before. Now we're going to do the numbers. How much bigger is, hmm, I don't like the nomenclature of this, by the way. I would have, well, like, all right, in this Snell's Law, we decide to trace the ray backwards the other way. Anyway, just make sure that N1 applies to the index of refraction of the medium here, which is air, which is 1. Now, I'm just a little lazy here, so I decided to approximate theta 1 for small angles. I'm going to approximate sine theta 1 as just approximately being equal to theta 1. So the approximate small angle version of n1 sine theta 1 is n1 theta 1 equals n2 theta 2. Small angle approximation for sines here. And so then we find, let's see, n1 is just 1. Um, n2 is 1.33 here. So we get the answer then that the angle here is smaller. Let's see. Theta 1 is larger by about 33%. Okay, so theta 1, theta 1 is now that's the path that your eye thinks 
the goggles light came from. Your eye naively, blindly, actually very carefully and precisely, extrapolates back as if this angle was theta 1. It's, it's, it's thinking straight lines. It's not thinking about the bend caused by the, the tilted surface of the water. So your eye extrapolates this object to be uh, an angle theta 1 away from this point. And so by parallel triangle, by, uh, sorry, by uh, similar triangles here, uh, if this angle is small, and sine theta 1 is approximately equal to theta 1, then this distance here is going to be 3 fourths, that's 1 over 1.33, 3 fourths of the true depth. The true depth is 1 meter. The apparent depth of the goggles is 0.75 meters. And so, first of all, the goggles are going to look 33% bigger than they actually are. I have absolutely noticed this, by the way. It's really noticeable with fish. In particular, I will never forget a time I was looking down and I saw a barracuda, and that thing was just huge. And the first half of it is all teeth. I swear it was big, actually. But, of course, at the time when I was trying to move myself away in the opposite direction, I didn't actually think about the fact that the barracuda was actually three-fourths as big as it appeared. To be, and it was further away by 33% than it appeared to be. With a pair of goggles, uh, you don't get so emotional in it. You can sit down and do a careful calculation. But if this is something uh, big and scary with lots of teeth, you might not realize that. I think this is the origin of most of those fish stories about the fish that got away. It always looks 33% bigger than it actually is. So they're not just liars. <clears throat> those guys that sit around with the beers, you know, and tell you what they almost caught. It's probably based on physics. Here's another example of the same thing. We've put what you know, really, your mind knows is really a straight line. It's not a bent straw. It's a straight straw. It's really going into the water. But you're looking at an angle here. And so what happens? It's basically the same process as before. Light rays from the tip of the straw come up to the surface and then bend away from the normal. They bend away. And if your eye is up here, you'll actually see the light rays appear to be emanating from the tip of the straw over here. You trace back the light rays to where they intersect, and you say the tip of the straw is here, because your, your eye and your brain has forgotten the bend. So you think the tip of the straw is over here. It really looks like the whole straw bent right at the surface where it entered the water due to refraction. Again, it's a classic illusion that everybody knows. This one I like very much. All of these refraction effects that I've been showing you here are a consequence of light going from a medium of one index of refraction to another one, where it changes, where n1 and n2 are different. What if n1 and n2 were not different? What if they were the same? So here's, here's a pretty classic example. You can see all kinds of refraction effects here because I've got a big glass uh, jar here, and then I've got a little glass jar in the middle, and there's air in between them. There's air outside the glass, there's air in here, there's air in here, and you can see all the surfaces and reflections and so on, and it's immediately obvious that there are two glasses there. The reason it's obvious to you is because of the difference between the index of refraction of glass, which is about one and a half, and the index of refraction of the air that's inside those surfaces. You can immediately see all the refraction happening, even if it's just looking against a, a sort of a vague blue background. You can see the differences. What if the index of refraction, what if I replace the air, get rid of the air, and put in between these glass surfaces a transparent fluid which has an index of refraction very similar to glass? I think in this example it's uh, peanut oil, for example. Apparently peanut oil is fairly cheap, so physics labs such as ours can afford to buy a few liters of the stuff without breaking the budget. If I replaced the air here with peanut oil, then there would be no change in the index of refraction. Going from here, it's glass, it's one and a half. Here, it's peanut oil, it's one and a half. Here, it's glass, it's one and a half. Here, it's one and a half peanut oil, glass, all 1.5 all the way through there, there would, be all, there would be no refraction and there would be no visual clues that your eye relies on to see that there's a second glass beaker in here. You'd be totally unaware that there was anything in there. Why? Because it's transparent 
And now it would have the same index of refraction as the medium around it. Let's look at what actually happens here. See, we've got one glass beaker sitting inside another glass beaker. We're going to fill it with peanut oil here. I hope we can save this and maybe make popcorn later on. And let's see what happens as the space it overflows here. It's a messy experiment. The peanut oil is going to spill out into this boundary between the two glass surfaces, and I bet you it's going to make this glass beaker, which is obviously still there, disappear, appear to disappear before your very eyes. Let's see if that happens. Oh yeah, the bottom's going away. It's like floating in nothing now. See, it looks like there's nothing in there, doesn't it? You know it's still there. The guy didn't get it, want to get his hand dirty. Uh, the glass is still in there, but there's no visual clue. There's no refraction at all that it was actually there.